Welcome to Julia for Talented Amateurs, where I make wholesome Julia tutorials for talented amateurs everywhere. I am your host, the Dabbling Doggo. I dabble. Last week, we learned how to use a text editor and some debugging techniques. Then we learned how to use Julia's package manager and how to add packages. Finally, we were introduced to the world of plotting using the Maki plotting package. That concluded part one of this tutorial series. Now that we have the basics covered, we can now begin to discuss some fascinating subjects, such as algorithms and recursion. It looks like there's another update for Atom, so let's take care of that before getting into today's tutorial. Double click on the Atom shortcut to open Atom. Click Update in the lower right corner. Update Language Julia to version 0.20.0. .0. Click Restart. Close Atom. Double click on the Atom shortcut. Close Settings tab. Adjust Side Panel. Click on the REPL. Hit Enter to start Julia. Close Atom. An algorithm is a set of instructions designed to perform a specific task. This can be a simple process like adding 1 plus 1, or a complex operation like an internet search engine. In computer programming, algorithms are often created as functions. These functions serve as mini programs that can be called by a larger program. For hobbyists like me, it's often good enough just to get a program to work. However, for professional programmers, getting a program to just work is not good enough. In many cases, there are multiple ways to perform the same task. Therefore, skilled programmers are always on the lookout for new algorithms that will complete their task as efficiently as possible. Let's take a look at an example of a single task and then use three different algorithms to solve it. We will try to solve the cube root of a number by using three different algorithms, guess and check, approximate solutions, and binary search. These examples were taken from Dr. Anna Bell's MIT lecture on this subject. All I did was translate her Python code into Julia code. The link is in the description below. Let's use the text editor now that we know how to use it. Click on the new Julia file icon to open up a new untitled document. Move the REPL panel by clicking and dragging the REPL tab. Move it below the untitled document. Adjust the height of the REPL panel by clicking and dragging the horizontal line. In case you're wondering, that faint vertical line in the untitled document is a guideline indicating 80 characters. Recall from the style guide tutorial that you should try to avoid using more than 80 characters per line. The first algorithm is called guess and check because this algorithm will literally just guess an answer and then check to see if it's correct. APS is a built-in function that calculates the absolute value of a number. For negative numbers, it returns the positive value. Click the last line of your code and hit Shift Enter to run the code. Notice that your cube root guess and check function showed up in the workspace panel. Let's try it out in the REPL. So that's interesting. Your cube root guess and check function only works on perfect cubes, and it took three guesses to figure out that the cube root of eight is two. It definitely works, but it's not very useful. Let's try another algorithm to see if we can do better. The next algorithm is called approximate solutions because it's literally going to find a solution that is approximately close in value to the actual answer.
Use the up arrow to get back to the last line and hit Shift Enter to run your code. Notice that your function cube root approximate solutions is now listed in the workspace panel. Let's try it out in the REPL. Whoa, what just happened? It took 192 guesses to calculate that the cube root of 7 is approximately 1.91. That's not very good. Let's see how it performs with a simpler example. It took 201 guesses to figure out that the cube root of 8 is 2. So this algorithm definitely works, but it's also super inefficient. Let's take a look at the code to see what it's doing. This algorithm is starting to guess at 0, just like the guess and check algorithm. However, instead of stepping up by 1, this algorithm is stepping up by 0.01, which is the value that you set in the variable increment. Then it's checking to see if the guess cubed is within 0.1 of your number. 0.1 is the value that you set for the variable sensitivity. If it is, then it stops guessing and then displays the result. You can tweak this function by changing the values of the variable's increment and sensitivity to make it take smaller steps or larger steps, or to be more sensitive or less sensitive. Compared to the guess and check algorithm, the approximate solutions algorithm is definitely more sophisticated, but it's also very inefficient. It may be okay for guessing small numbers, but imagine trying to use this algorithm on a large number. Let's see if we can do better. This last algorithm is called binary search. In the MIT lectures, it's referred to as bisection search, which I think is a more descriptive name. The term binary search and bisection search refers to the same algorithm. Use the up arrow to get back to the last line and hit Shift Enter to run your code. Notice that your function cube root binary search is now listed in the workspace panel. Let's try it out in the REPL. So that looks better. It only took 12 guesses to figure out the answer. Let's take a closer look at what it did. Unlike the other two algorithms, the binary search algorithm didn't start guessing at 0. Its first guess was 3.5, which is halfway between 0 and 7. Its next guess was 1.75, which is halfway between 0 and 3.5. Interestingly, its next guess was 2.625, which is higher than 1.75. How did it pick that number? The algorithm realized that it had gone too low, so it went the other way. 2.625 is halfway between 1.75 and 3.5. The binary search algorithm is guessing the midpoint of a high and low value. Then it checks to see if the solution is higher than that midpoint or lower than that midpoint. If the solution is higher, then it eliminates the entire lower half. If the solution is lower, then it eliminates the entire higher half. It repeats this process until it finds a solution that is within the sensitivity that you set using the sensitivity variable. You can see why the term bisection search is such a descriptive term. It's because the algorithm is literally bisecting a line in the middle to guess at a solution. The term binary search is more commonly used, but I still think bisection search is a good way to remember what this algorithm is actually doing. Now that we have three algorithms for cube root, Let's compare their performance.
It took the guess and check algorithm 11 guesses to figure out that the cube root of 1000 is 10. It took the approximate solutions algorithm 1001 guesses. And it took the binary search algorithm 22 guesses. Now let's try a very large number. It took the guess and check algorithm 101 guesses to figure out that the cube root of 1 million is 100. It took the approximate solutions algorithm 10,001 guesses. But the binary search algorithm only took 40 guesses. As the numbers get larger, both guess and check and approximate solutions become less appealing, while binary search becomes the most efficient. For this reason, the binary search algorithm is one of the most popular algorithms for solving many different problems. There's a lot more to discuss regarding algorithms, but I'm going to save that for next week's tutorial. For now, let's switch gears and talk about recursion. Before starting the next section, save your untitled document. Click anywhere in your untitled document and click on the save icon. Name your file kubrootalgorithms.jl. Don't forget the .jl file extension. Close your document. In the REPL, type an exit to start a new Julia session. Open a new untitled document. This section is taken from Dr. Eric Grimson's MIT lecture on the subject. All I did was translate his Python code into Julia code. The link is in the description below. Recursion occurs when a thing is defined in terms of itself. In computing, recursion is a method of problem solving where the overall solution depends on solutions to smaller versions of the same problem. A recursive algorithm divides a problem into smaller, easy to manage subproblems. The output returned from one recursion after processing one subproblem then becomes the input for the subsequent process. A function that calls itself from within its own code is called a recursive function. Did you follow any of that? Recursion is about as close as you can get to magic in computing. It's difficult to wrap your mind around, so it's best to take a look at some examples. In Atom, move the REPL panel to the middle in between your untitled document and the workspace panel so that you have a tall, narrow REPL panel. Adjust the vertical bars in the REPL panel and the workspace panel accordingly. Click in line one of the untitled document. The first example is about multiplication. Another way to think about multiplication is that x times y is the same thing as adding x to itself y times. For example, five times 20 is the same as 5 plus 5 plus 5, etc. If you repeat that process 20 times, you'll end up with 100, which is the value of 5 times 20. Let's create two functions to perform multiplication in this manner. The first function will use the familiar iterative approach using a for loop, and the second function will use a recursive algorithm. At this point, all of this code should look familiar to you. The print line functions are not necessary here. I included them so that we could take a look at what the code is doing. Use the up arrow to get to the last line and hit shift enter. Click in the REPL to try out your new function. Here's a recursive version of the same task. Use the up arrow and hit shift enter. Go to the REPL to try out your new function. Whoa, what is that? Let's take a closer look at the output to see if we can understand what's going on. 
Unlike the iterative version, this recursive version is not performing a calculation at each step. Instead, it's calling itself to calculate 5 times 19. In order to calculate 5 times 19, it's calling itself to calculate 5 times 18, and so on until it reaches the base case of 5 times 1, which is 5. Armed with this information, the algorithm goes back up the ladder to plug in the values until it reaches the top again. By the time it gets to the top, it knows that 5 times 20 is equal to 5 plus 95, so it returns a value of 100. Pretty wild, huh? In terms of memory usage, each recursive call to a function creates its own local scope, so the bindings of variables in a local scope are not changed by recursive calls. The flow of control is passed back to the previous scope once the function call returns a value. In order for a recursive algorithm to work, it requires two pieces. One, a recursive case, which is a smaller version of the overall problem that it's trying to solve, and two, a base case, so they can stop calling itself and can begin returning values back to the callers. Without the base case, the recursive algorithm will be stuck in an infinite loop. Let's take a look at another example. This next example calculates the factorial of a number. The factorial of a number is the product of all of the positive integers less than or equal to that number. For example, the factorial of 5 is 1 times 2 times 3 times 4 times 5, which is equal to 120. Let's create two functions to calculate the factorial of any number. The first function will use an iterative approach using a for loop, and the second function will use a recursive algorithm. Hit up arrow, shift enter. Click in your REPL panel to try out your new function. You can check your math. Julia Ashley has a built-in function called factorial, so you can check it that way as well. Hit up arrow, shift enter. Click in your REPL to try out your new function. Just like in the multiplication example, this recursive algorithm is not performing a calculation at each step. Instead, it's calling itself multiple times until it reaches the base case, where the factorial of 1 is equal to 1. Armed with this knowledge, the recursive algorithm works its way back up the ladder and plugs in the values until it reaches the final result of 120. Even though the recursive algorithm is hypnotic to observe, it's not always the most efficient. This next example highlights the inefficiency of the recursive algorithm and offers a workaround to help it perform more efficiently. This next example returns the requested Fibonacci number in the Fibonacci sequence. The Fibonacci sequence starts at 0 and 1, and then the following numbers is the sum of the previous two numbers. So the next example in this sequence would be 0 plus 1, or 1. The next number is 1 plus 1, or 2. The next number is 1 plus 2, or 3. The next number is 2 plus 3, or 5. And so on, all the way to infinity. Let's create two functions that will return the requested Fibonacci number in the Fibonacci sequence. The first function will use an iterative approach using a for loop, and the second function will use a recursive algorithm. Hit up arrow, shift enter. Click in your REPL to try out your new function. So far, so good.
hit up arrow, shift enter. Click in your REPL to try out your new function. Okay, so this is a little more complicated than the previous examples. So let's take a look at a diagram of what's going on. The recursive algorithm is going down the ladder until it finds the base case. However, as the algorithm works its way back up the ladder, it realizes that it has a few other branches that it also needs to solve. The algorithm actually repeats the process on a couple of other branches. Along the way, it's recalculating values that it's already calculated. That's because each recursive call sets up a new local scope, so the algorithm can't see the other calculations. It ends up with the same answer, but it did a lot of unnecessary work. This next example offers a workaround to this inefficiency by using a dictionary to store intermediate values. This technique is called memoization. The memoization technique requires a new dictionary every time, so I've broken this up into two separate functions. fib underscore m is the actual recursive function that populates a dictionary with the intermediate values. If a value exists in the dictionary, the algorithm skips the calculation so it doesn't repeat itself. Don't forget, hit up arrow, shift enter. fib underscore memoization is a function that sets up a clean dictionary and then calls the fib underscore m function. Be sure to hit shift enter for both functions. Click in your REPL to try out your new function. Okay, that looks a little better. Let's test it out on a larger number to see if it really is more efficient than the original recursive algorithm. Well, that's a mess. That looks much cleaner. So it works. By now, you should be getting the sense that the recursive algorithm is cool to look at, but it's often inefficient. So why bother with recursion at all? Why not just stick with the iterative algorithms? The reason why recursion is important is because there are some cases where the recursive algorithm is actually more efficient. One of the most famous examples of this is the Tower of Hanoi. The Tower of Hanoi is a puzzle that starts with a stack of disks on one rod next to two empty rods. The object of the puzzle is to move the stack of disks from one rod to another rod following a set of rules. 1. Only one disk can be moved at a time. 2. Each move consists of taking the upper disk from one of the stacks and placing it on top of another stack or an empty rod. 3. No larger disk may be placed on top of a smaller disk. The challenge here is to create a function that will generate a cheat sheet to let the player know the most efficient way to solve the puzzle given the number of disks. Hit up arrow, shift enter. This code looks deceptively simple. Let's see if it works. Click in the REPL and try out your new function. This is the base case where you're moving one disk from rod one to rod two. This is the recursive case, which is the simplified version of the larger problem to be solved. In order to move a stack with two disks, it takes a minimum of three steps. 1. You have to move the top disk off the bottom disk. 2. You have to move the bottom disk to a different rod than the top disk. 3. You have to move the top disk back on top of the bottom disk. These three steps are the reason there are three recursive function calls in the code. These three steps are repeated recursively until the overall solution is found. Let's take a look at what it looks like with three disks. There are seven steps here. Why? Shouldn't this be some multiple of three steps? If you look closely, you'll see there are actually three steps. However, two of the steps require three steps of their own. Let's take a look at a diagram. 1. Move top disk off bottom disk. 
This step requires three moves. Move disk from 1 to 2, move disk from 1 to 3, move disk from 2 to 3. 2. Move bottom disk. This step only requires one move. Move disk from 1 to 2. 3. Move top disk to bottom disk. This step requires three moves. Move disk from 3 to 1, move disk from 3 to 2, move disk from 1 to 2. Amazing, right? How did it know to do all that? This is the magic of recursion. I realize that this is just computing, but I have to confess that it still looks like magic to me. Before we go, save your document as myrecursions.jl. Well, that's it for now. Today, we learned about algorithms and recursion, two very challenging but important subjects. Next week, we'll dive deeper into algorithms and then learn about program efficiency. If you enjoyed this video and you feel like you learned something new, please give it a thumbs up. For more wholesome Julia tutorials, please be sure to subscribe and hit that bell. New tutorials are posted on Sundays. If you have any questions, please post them in the comments below. Feel free to spread the word by sharing this video, since I'm sure you'll all agree that this is the finest tutorial on all of YouTube. Worst tutorial ever.